Go, go ahead and get started. Wow, this is a popular session. <laughs> this must be a session only for really smart people. Uh, no, sorry, Robert, only really smart people. We were just talking about that. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. We'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Mike Waldrop. I haven't met all of you. Some of you look familiar. Um, my role at Alfresco, I'm part of the solutions engineering team, so the pre-sales technical team. Uh, we're going to be talking about deployment on Amazon today. This, this slide deck was actually created by um, one of my peers. Uh, some of you may know, if you've been around Alfresco for a while, Luis Salah. People know Luis. Once you meet him, you don't forget him. He's a great guy. Um, so we're going to walk through this. We'll, it'll probably go pretty quick, especially with this small of a crowd, and we can be rather interactive as we get going. But just to kind of get started, I think it's sort of helpful to understand um, what, you, what you guys know about Alfresco and so forth. So how many, how many folks in here are from partner companies, SIs or integrators, just one? Um, and how many of you are using Alfresco today? You're a customer, you use either Alfresco Enterprise or community? Only a couple, okay. Um, so the folks that are using it, are you running it on a bare metal server? Is anybody running it just installed Alfresco on bare metal? Nobody? Virtualization? So you're doing VMware or something like that? Okay. And is, is everybody running it on-premise? Running it in cloud? Who, is in, yeah. Trying to decide? Uh, no, the decision is there unless you tell us otherwise. Uh-oh. This is, this is a, a lot of pressure on me. <laughs> um, so. How long do you think it takes to install Alfresco? The ones that have done it, how long does it take to set up Alfresco? How long? Not long. Uh huh. Okay. So that was for a single instance of Alfresco on a single server. Is that production ready? Yeah. So how long for production ready? redundant, fault-tolerant, highly available, secured, I'll let you know when I'm there. <laughs> clustered Alfresco, like right? Exactly. And, and the other game that's kind of fun to play is you're the consultant, I'm the customer, and you're going to tell me how much scope you need, right? So I want you to set up my production system, and if I'm a consultant and somebody asks me to do it on premise with just installers and, and a book. I'm going to say it's going to take at least a couple of weeks, right, to have it up and tested and feel confident that I've got a production system that's fault tolerant, redundant, highly available, all of that sort of stuff. So this is sort of a picture of a clustered Alfresco, right? So we have hopefully multiple instances of Alfresco because if you only have one, you need two or three more. I'm in sales. I don't know if I told you that. Um, load balancer, you need an index, right? Solar, you need some storage, you need a database, right? Is that it? Are we good? Is this a production alfresco ready to go? Yeah, probably not. You need something that looks a little more like this, right? Redundant, fault tolerant, multiple databases. I need networks configured correctly and secured for intrusion prevention. Um, I need it all to fail over if something bad happens. This is what I need. This is why it takes a couple of weeks to stand up my production environment. So I mean, I've certainly seen projects, and I don't know about those of you who have done it, I've seen projects that do take weeks or months. And this doesn't even count. Um, for those of you that have done the install before, how long does it take to get a server into your server room? 90 days? Yeah, probably. How long does it take to get a DBA to create an account for your database? Week. Something like that. So th this is the world that we're um, you know, talking about. And it's not because people are not smart or don't know what they're doing. It's just that is the IT world we live in. We want, you know, a lot of times Alfresco is very much a mission critical system. It needs to be very secure. It needs to be very available. And our complex IT worlds these days, 
it takes a lot to get all this stuff done. So what if you could launch that picture that I just showed you in just a few minutes? Let's give it a shot. Now, if anybody saw my presentation before, I took the decision for this summit to not tempt the demo gods. So I'm going to use a screen cam, which some would say is cheating. But I say it is highly effective and more reliable. But just to show you what we're talking about, I can log into Amazon and use CloudFormation. If you've never used CloudFormation, I can say I'm ready to create a new stack. So a stack in Alfresco terms is the entire environment that I need. I can give it a name. And I can use uh, a template file for cloud formation that describes that stack. We provide this one. It's out in the open source community. I'll, I'll show you later where to get it from. Uh, but it comes with everything that's needed to set this up. So it starts with asking for some particular metadata. So um, you have to create an S3 bucket for storage, give it a name. You need to tell it what size instances you want. Um, you can give it specific availability zones that you want those servers to stand up in. Uh, so if those of you that are familiar with Amazon, each individual region has multiple availability zones. So I can set up two out of the western region, and that's just as if I had two separate data centers. Um, put in a few parameters like passwords and, and, and things like that. And now from this, the cloud formation template can go out and create that entire stack that I just saw. So it gives me a validation, here's what all I'm going to build, um, here are all the parameters that I'm going to pass it, and now when I click continue, Amazon will start um, creating and building out all of those components that we saw, and we're going to look in more detail what all those components are, but you can see here, it's creating users, it's standing up servers, it's configuring security, all of this is defined in that one file that, that now describes that entire environment. So not only can I do this pretty quickly and pretty easily, it's also going to adhere to the best practices that we're recommending for people who want to stand up on Amazon, right? Because there's a lot of, you know, what do you do today when you get ready to do an install? You go look at a bunch of documentation, you read through it, you try to figure out what's going to make the most sense for your world. You may talk to a consultant. You may spend quite a bit of time just trying to figure out what the components should be, uh, how I should configure them. That is all predefined in this template. Does that make sense? There was no oohs and ahs, so it must not have been that great. Even a little bit of a ooh, okay, no, maybe not. So uh, let's talk about that. So let's talk about what some of the components are. We're going to dive into to some of those uh, in detail here. Um, so we are using a load balancer on the front, uh, going to two configurations across availability zones. Uh, so we've got the kind of the front end web tier. Um, this is the, the tier that allows us to log directly in from the Alfresco side through SSH, and we're using NAT as sort of a bastion host to get into that, because then I can turn that off and not allow terminal-based access to these instances if I like. Using RDS to provide redundant uh, storage with MySQL, and we'll talk more about some of these components here as we go through the presentation. So this environment is pretty um, sophisticated compared to even what a lot of people, when they start to first stand up Alfresco on premise, it may take, you know, people may take months or so just to get to this much um, redundancy and security. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I, I don't know, how many of you are pretty familiar with Amazon already? It sounds like you guys are, several of you are. Um, so uh, the amazing thing about AWS to me is every month I get an email with a whole new set of services that they provide. There's, there's hundreds of Amazon services. But the three that matter the most or the four that matter the most in this configuration that we're talking about uh, is certainly the EC2 piece. That's the compute piece. Those are virtual servers that actually run the application. There's the storage, um, S3 storage. So redundant, fault tolerant, secure, reliable, elastic, uh, so it can scale up very quickly to add more and more storage. RDS is the relational database service. 
So it's MySQL with all the things on the front end to make it easy for Amazon to quickly spin up all of those databases for you. Um, and the virtual private cloud. So that keeps your uh, installation private from the rest of the internet. You can't get to any of those servers or any of those components from any part of the internet except for where you have explicitly exposed it. Make sense? Lots of nodding heads, you already knew this. And then the one other piece is the cloud formation. So the cloud formation template, um, we'll look at it in more detail here in just a moment. But this is how I actually go in and configure all of the various components of the, uh, that environment that we talked about. Um, we can create EC2 instances using existing AMIs. So we start with an AMI foundation that is basically a blank operating system. Um, we can define all of the subnets, the firewall rules, the databases, you know, really any of the AWS resources that you need. How many people here have used CloudFormation? You guys have used it? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> the very top of this file, um, you can actually start to see some of these very specific things like this is an example template. It's not the full-blown one that I just ran. This is a non-clustered install cloud formation template. It's very simple. Uh, so being able to stand up in an availability zone, an AMI of a specific instance type, uh, deal with things like the SSH keys. Um, so Amazon will create for you a public-private key to connect through your terminal to the machine, um, setting up the firewall rules, et cetera. Certainly it's important as we set up multiple servers to absolutely lock down all of the intercommunication. So not just, um, um, not just the exposure to the outside world, but make sure even each server talking to each other only speaks the correct protocols and nothing else. So uh, we're able to set up firewall rules for the outside world as well as locking down some of the other connections between the servers. And here's just some more examples of uh, how you can use variables in this file to say that when I stand up this server, the way I'm going to get to it is referring to some of these values that were entered in that first screen that I saw, like the, the server name the, and the public DNS name that actually comes back from the Amazon APIs. Make sense? So, <clears throat> Um, the, the concept of using the multiple availability zones. Um, so again, within the Amazon infrastructure, within a region, so in this case in US West, I can set up a totally separate zone. So those are uh, as if they are completely separate physical um, locations. We set up a master and slave relationship between the databases so that they are kept in sync. We keep each different sort of role of this stack on a separate subnet so we can absolutely control the communications between the two. So the front end world can really only get to the front tier. I can't even really get back here to the back end of this VPC. It's all within a virtual private cluster of, of Amazon. And even the access to the, the application tier here can be very specifically limited. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment here. Um, <clears throat> if you look at one particular zone that's here, this is a two node cluster, two Alfresco servers. We've got the load balancing, the, the Amazon elastic load balancing in the front. Um, the NAT instance is that sort of bastion host that lets me get through to the um, application tier to do my configuration. Um, and then the idea being at any point you can just take down that bastion host and now there's no path to get to these servers from, um, from the internet if that's desired. And this actual template, we'll look at it in more detail. Those AMIs are blank operating system AMIs. And the cloud formation template will actually go out and get the components it needs. So it can actually dynamically go out and download Alfresco software, Alfresco components, other Amazon components that need to be in there. Um, so it's not simply replicating an image that was pre-built. It's actually dynamically creating 
uh, the components of that image. So let's take a look at that for just a moment. <clears throat> so this is the, the template itself. Uh, I won't, we're going to go line by line, and there's going to be a test at the end. So you guys ready? Line number one. No, just kidding. Um, so there's a lot of things that you are, it's more declarative that I can declare, you know, what some of all the components are. Um, <clears throat> we're providing this example uh, as an open source example that you can take and modify. Uh, and we've made some simplifications just to make it more convenient. So this section is basically a set of script commands that do some of the installation and configuration of the Alfresco instance. Makes it easy for you to go in there and change some of the stuff and prevents having to deal with uh, multiple files and multiple components. Um, we're actually looking at now making this a little bit more modular, a little bit more um, robust and sophisticated, but we really wanted something that we could get out quickly and easily that everybody could use. Um, so you can see here where it's literally going in and, and doing some uh, dynamic editing of global properties files, um, you know, adding, you know, particular components to the install. So a lot of those things that you would normally end up doing manually if you did the install yourself, we're just automating a lot of those steps, uh, either in script form or in the, the higher level cloud formation uh, components that allow me to, to interact with those. Make sense? Anybody want to try to debug this and run it real quick? No? Okay. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yeah, I think creating different components. Uh, okay. Yeah, so the question is, what, what, kind of, um, what kind of ways are we thinking about modularizing this component? Are we going to use the cloud formation structure? And the answer is, that's what we're thinking right now, um, is uh, creating a set of uh, independent cloud formation components uh, that make up this environment instead of all one big massive file. Uh, so calling some of these things as resources and making them independent instead of uh, one big, just single file. Make sense? Um, and again, this is sort of a, um, uh, there's a couple of reasons why we've been doing this work. Uh, and a lot of it is just to increase adoption of deploying Alfresco onto Amazon as easily as possible. We're seeing a lot of customers that are asking us about using Amazon. Um, we've created, let me uh, back to the slide deck here. We've created a couple of documents that talk about this in exquisite detail. So there's actually a white paper on this architecture. Why did we set it up the way we did? What, is all, what do all those components do? So this reference architecture white paper which is actually on the Amazon site, along with the actual implementation guide. It gives you all the details. If you wanted to do this manually, you could do it. it tells you everything that that cloud formation template script does. Uh, very well documented. It's 30 or so pages. It has a little bit of thunk to it, so uh, it's a pretty good document, actually. Um, <clears throat> but it sort of describes this in detail, and this is uh, version one, if you will. Uh, so, based on people using this and getting some feedback, um, we imagine making some implementation changes here. We also have some uh, Alfresco partners uh, that are doing a lot of work with Amazon, and we imagine they're going to start contributing and helping flesh this out more and more as we go. We'll talk a little bit about security. Um, the, the work that we've done here um, around security is mostly around the idea of intrusion prevention. You know, the biggest concern is I'm going to the cloud, this thing is out in the public internet, I just want to make sure people can't get to it. Um, and it's pretty locked down. I mean, obviously, private subnets, the NAT host uh, that we talked about is sort of the SSH gatekeeper, firewalls and load balancers that only, the load balancers are configured to only route um, and proxy HTTP and HTTPS and, you know, the specific protocols that need to be proxied and keeping the database in complete isolation. So 
Um, we feel like this is probably, without going nutty, that's probably about as secure as you can get from an intrusion perspective, like making sure people can't get to those servers, you can't, you know, uh, spray a bunch of uh, data at the individual components. Now, security in general, there are other things to talk about. Um, so when you deploy onto Amazon, the platform itself provides uh, a certain amount of tooling that we've talked about for creating intrusion prevention um, sort of security. But there's other things that you have to do, and this is just sort of normal bread and butter stuff. It's a shared responsibility between the platform provider and the customer who's standing up their environment. So things like configuring ACLs inside of Alfresco, right? This doesn't address that because that's business specific. How do you want your users to get to content, et cetera? Um, dealing with keys and credentials. Um, so um, there's a number of ways that uh, customers are thinking about this. Uh, and, and best practices around how do you deal with credentials and keys and identity access management, the IAM stuff, all of that sort of thing, as well as um, encryption keys if you want to encrypt the content. Where do you keep those keys? How do you manage them? Uh, we've seen a lot of implementations getting very creative um, there. Uh, so again, that's not necessarily addressed by uh, this um, cloud formation template alone because it's very business specific. Um, using SSL um, and then of course Amazon has voluminous amounts of information and best practices around security that need to be uh, managed and followed, et cetera. <clears throat> so let's talk dollars and cents, just fundamentally uh, what, can, what can using Amazon as a platform to run Alfresco, what can it do for you from a financial perspective? So um, we took some numbers from, from Amazon and some other places to talk about, you know, what kinds of costs can you expect? And really, if you open up your scope to look not just at the initial implementation costs, but over time costs of on-premise hardware versus Amazon, um, you can start to see some pretty significant, significant savings. You know, usually most people's first introduction to Amazon, they first stand something up and it first starts running, it can start to feel kind of expensive. But when you look at it over the, the broader scale of, you know, less IT staff to just manage, you know, uh, frames and disk drives, et cetera, um, and sort of this pay as you go, um, so the elasticity to be able to expand and contract your needs as, as uh, dictated by your usage can really lead to some pretty significant, um, so this is five-year TCO of Amazon per application, uh, so they're able to imagine a world where it's almost a three times uh, savings uh, on infrastructure. Um, certainly, I think you could make the case that the install and configure can easily be 30x faster because you can literally go, uh, it takes about 15 minutes to run that cloud formation template and get the whole thing up and running assuming uh, everything um, is configured correctly and it can easily be a few weeks to a month or, or what have you before you do it without um, something like this. Um, you can definitely get some IT productivity gains. Again, you can leverage the best practices that are already documented here. You can, uh, you know, use the elasticity and, and some of these other things that just, you know, take some of those concerns off of the plate of the IT professional. Um, and really, it's go to market. So we do see customers all the time that say, uh, I'm just looking to get my Alfresco solution up and running faster. I need, you know, it's addressing a key business need. I need to do it sooner rather than later. So uh, again, over the time, so we've seen a Forrester study that talks about uh, ROI on the Alfresco investment itself, um, that it's typical for customers to start to recoup their investment in Alfresco uh, 10 months after their launch date. So if I can shrink down my implementation time, it just gets me to that ROI sooner. Um, so, you know, all of this stuff can start to add up. 
right, to be significant savings. So um, I think what we're starting to see is we don't see a lot of people that, I mean, we can, we can spend a lot of time debating specific numbers. I don't think there's a whole lot of debate that this is definitely uh, when I can use a cloud platform, the cost savings are pretty significant. Uh, would you guys agree with that? Do most of you feel like if I had that option, and some people do and don't, and, and some of that's changing, but um, feel like it's a pretty economical way to go? Um, so again, this is sort of about how quickly can I stand up an environment. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about this is um, internally inside of Alfresco, uh, one of the things that we're starting to see is not only thinking about a production environment, but if you need a development environment that's robust and you need to get it up quickly, um, the ability to be able to spin one up very, very quickly in Amazon in a repeatable way um, is super powerful. Um, our internal development teams, when they're uh, doing development work for our cloud product, they can create and destroy test environments very, very quickly because it's all automated in a similar way. We're not using cloud formation for everything that we do internally, but the idea of an automated recipe, if you will, that can create that environment quickly, uh, very important from the, I need to create a development or a QA environment quickly and then destroy it uh, when I'm done. Uh, without having to go find a server, find some space, you know, do the installs, do the config, do whatever, but being able to do that quickly is very valuable. Uh, of course, we talked about security a bit um, and some of the different aspects of uh, how to talk about cost effectiveness of, of using, uh, in this case, Amazon. Now, uh, at Alfresco, we've got a lot of experience with Amazon uh, because we, we utilize that for um, our cloud service offering. Um, some of these same ROI factors could be applied to other cloud platforms as well. Um, we just don't have any of the automation tools that we've created yet, but we've, I've been talking to some customers here today that are starting to use the Google stack. Certainly there are other cloud providers as well uh, that give you some of this. One other thing I wanted to point out um, that recently launched on Amazon is our test drive program. This is a really, really cool way for customers to quickly see not only, I wanna go spin up Alfresco and take a look at it. I, if, if I, if for customers that don't know Alfresco, you can go to the Amazon website, go to the test drive section and actually launch a complete Amazon based Alfresco environment to try out for free, no expense, no cost. Uh, stand it up, can start to play with it, uh, as well as some of our partners are, are starting to put their solutions on top of Alfresco into this test drive environment. So if I'm trying to do web content management and I want to try out this crafter product, if you walk by their booth out there and you saw it and you're like, oh, that looks kind of interesting, I'd like to play with it. You can go to Amazon, click the button, bang, up comes a completely configured, uh, running production, uh, not production, uh, demo environment with Crafter and Alfresco. It's got guides and tutorials and videos to help you walk through it. Um, so this is a way to very quickly see Alfresco combined with some of these solutions from some of the providers that are here today. Um, so here's some of the resources and I'll leave this up here so you can go and get it. Um, if you have a question, just call Luis, because I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'll give you my email as well. I just forgot to add mine to it. Uh, but Luis Salah is the gentleman's name who um, is responsible for our Amazon relationship inside of Alfresco, and he was a big part of developing this cloud formation template. The, the template is out on GitHub, a uh, section we call Alfresco Lab, so you can download it, play with it, um, freely available out there. Uh, as a start point, and we're starting to work with customers now that are using this as a starting point and then modifying it for their environment, adding it, tweaking it, so forth. Um, okay, questions? Yes. Sorry. There we go. Pricing for the uh, Alfresco, when we get into AWS, a CPU is not nearly as powerful as on-premise. How are you pricing core CPUs versus AWS CPUs versus uh, equivalent yeah. CPUs? 
Yeah. Um, guys, help me out. I can't remember what we. What's that? Yeah. We have a, a guide for because it depends on if, if it's X large or yeah, it depends on the number of virtual CPUs. It correspond the, uh, given our fresco number of CPUs. We can share this. I, I don't remember the, the, the figures. Yeah, I can't remember the numbers. Off I top can share head, with you. In I, I would really appreciate that because yeah. yeah. full. Show me your wallet and I'll tell you how much it costs. I don't want. <laughs> Oh, come on, it's like when your car breaks down on the sidewalk in the south. It's like, how much you got? Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, make, I'll give you my card, um, and we'll make sure that you get that information. But um, we, do, we do have mapping. I think there's more questions. Anybody else can raise a hand, and we'll get it over. You mentioned uh, AW, or partners that do a lot of AWS work. Uh-huh. Which ones are your better partners for AWS? Uh, and where are their strengths versus others? Sure. So um, a lot of our partners are doing some amount of AWS work. Probably one of our uh, premier partners that have done a lot of Amazon work even before they became Alfresco partners are a company called 8K Miles based out of Virginia. Uh, there are a lot of ex-Amazon people that work there. Um, so they've uh, done a lot of work there. They've done a lot of work with Folks who want to kind of take security to the next level, things like encrypt all the content, keep the keys locally instead of storing the encryption keys in, in Amazon and things like that. They've done a lot of work there. Uh, but a lot of our other platinum partners now are starting to do Amazon work. Our friends at Zia do quite a bit. Um, uh, and, and most of the other guys have done some as well. So um, I think um, uh, it's probably more a matter of of um, either any particular security requirements you have that are unique, or uh, if you have a solution that you're adding on top of Alfresco that needs to leverage more of the cloud, then that's probably the part to think about uh, in, from a partner selection perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and just one last thing on the price comparison. The thing that you didn't mention, which makes it pay for itself in every case, performance environments. Your load testing environments, Yes. if you're in on-premises, that's iron that's just sitting there doing nothing. Yep. With Amazon, you're paying for it for 12 hours and shutting it down. Yep. That alone, you know, yeah, Amazon makes money off you. You know, there's somewhere there's making, you know, they have to make their margins. Sure. But your performance environment, because of how many nodes you have to have, and you're using them for less than 10% of the time. Yeah. Yeah, we do that internally. We do a lot of benchmarking of our product internally, and we're using a lot of the Amazon stack to do that. Um, and if you didn't know, our Amazon, our uh, Alfresco cloud-based solution, if you've ever used that, that all runs on the Amazon stack. So that's where we've cut our teeth a lot on how to leverage that infrastructure to, to run Alfresco. Uh, curious if you have any, have any guidance on like different use cases. Um, as far as sizing and things go, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, if you have VPC, you have either direct connect or, or VPN into your on-premise environment. But if you're using, say, more share or more uh, CMIS or, um, you know, in our case, we're probably going to be doing both and then some image uh, work that we want to move mm -hmm. up there, like as far as... Um, just anything, white papers or whatever on, you know, you should use a large, you should make sure you're, sure. you know, this wide, this big, for example. Yeah, so um, a lot of that is very dependent on a lot of things, right? So it's definitely more art than science. Um, Amazon provides some tools that try to help you quantify uh, scale. Uh, and we've taken some of that and tried to create a, a kind of simplified version. So we've created some spreadsheet tools that say, you know, amount of content and a few things like that to try to help you get there. Um, so yes, we, we do have some of those tools okay. that we can share. Um, and Amazon has some that are very much more complicated uh, that can help you really start to extrapolate it out. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a little, it's a little, 
e even you know, take Amazon out of the mix, just scaling Alfresco based on what you're doing is a little bit of, of art along with science, and we can help you kind of figure that piece out. And then once we kind of understand that, that helps us kind of get to the Amazon. So I don't know, Tony, if you wanted to add. Yeah, just to add that it's a mix between our sizing guidelines and the Amazon calculator. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because the, um, like the auto scaling groups kind of bring a whole nother, you know, angle at it too, where in our business, we, we tend to be real spiky toward the end of the year. Yeah. And so similar questions on insurance, you know, licensing and, you know, so we're, we're actually going to chat later too about, about this, but just kind of curious from your perspective or for the group. Yeah, so. I'd love to know. Yeah. So, um, so we're starting to think about what we need to do from a licensing perspective to make it more elastic. I mean, the, the, the truth of the matter is this is kind of new ground for Alfresco to think about elasticity and pricing. Um, so, hey, I'm a sales guy, you need the most, and then you just pay us that and we're all good, so no problem. Uh, but, uh, so we've talked about more utility pricing, especially on the Amazon stack instead of, you know, so forth, but, you know, th th that's just sort of new ground that we haven't necessarily hashed out. So what we typically do is, is um, we're all about trying to create win-win with our customers. You know, you help us understand what you're trying to do. We try to come to some agreement that makes sense. Um, and we tend to be as reasonable as we possibly can there because there's just not a perfect licensing model that handles, I want to triple my capacity for one month and then I want it to go down. Well, yeah, I don't want to pay triple the price. That doesn't make sense. I might want to pay, you know, it might be fair to pay a little bit more, but probably not triple, right? Uh, so some of that is just kind of uh, us working together as, as companies and partners uh, as opposed to a, a, a really well-defined, articulated price model that fits. Another question? So another question on pricing. So I'm looking at the site. It has an example, and it's five paragraphs to explain how to pay for something, right? So, and then it asked me, it asked me what region I want to be in for my pricing. So, so if I got people all over the world, and I have a big plant in, in, in India, do I need to tell you? I mean, does it matter where we set up the so, clouds if we have, you know, concentrations of workers in different places? Yeah. Are, are you looking at an Alfresco page or an Amazon no, page? No, I'm just looking at an Amazon page. Yeah, so Amazon has different data centers and regions, and their pricing is very complex because it yeah. takes into account a lot of different things. Um, so depending on which data center, they have different prices um, because they have different scale and. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of Amazon's. Uh, but you make that transparent. That's nothing that we have to consider. Pardon? You make that transparent. Uh, Amazon doesn't make it transparent, but we have Amazon metrics that we're working with. Okay. Right. Yeah. I'll make sure you're involved with those. Okay. Thanks. So for, from our perspective, from Alfresco's perspective, we don't really care what region you're in when you use Alfresco. That has nothing to do with us. The the model that you know, we use with Amazon, it's called bring your own license. So you negotiate a license with Alfresco and then you deal with Amazon to do it on your platform side. Uh, so just like we don't care what kind of HP server you have, we don't care what kind of Amazon you have. Well, what will make a difference is a lot of your users are coming from far away and there's a lot of latency involved. Yeah. That's where you're going to want to pick your regions appropriately. That's correct. So architecturally from, uh, from how, where end users are, et cetera, the, the, the comment is, you know, how do you scale globally and get to the users and get to the edges of the network and all of that. Um, and we, we've got some experience in helping people try to figure that out. It's, it's a hard problem. If I got users all over the globe, where do I put the server so that they can get the best performance? And you can utilize, you know, some of the capabilities within Amazon will do caching and, and a little bit of kind of CDN sort of stuff to distribute some of the stuff to the edges of the network. So some of that will help you out there. But you're yeah, right. And the, you have the to other that thing, out. as far as that goes, I, I also administer the Akamai yep. a, a account for where I am. And so Akamai has something called well, web acceleration where yep. you can actually reduce that latency significantly. We actually had a case where we had a group in Australia that wanted to run their website, but they didn't want to run it in Australia. They actually wanted to run it out of Chicago, even yeah. though the most number of users were going to be coming from Australia. Yeah. So we actually saw a reduction in latency, I would say close to 90%. For a pure web traffic? Yeah. Yeah. Which was con incredible considering it was literally, traffic was literally traveling halfway around the world. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was just plain, it was pretty much plain vanilla HTTP. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but the it Yeah. yeah. I was surprised. The, the Akamai accelerator actually is a decent product from them at a reasonable cost, which I've never seen from Akamai in the last <laughs> 20 years. Yeah. And, there, and there's a, when, you, when you're talking about Alfresco and, and kind of content and repository as well as a, a web based application tier in share, there's a lot of considerations when you get to sort of this global. Roll out and uh, do I do multiple servers? Do I do you know all these? There, there's a lot of things to take into account, and a lot of ways that you can skin that cat, so to speak. Just, oh, go ahead. One thing to add in terms of in terms of pricing um, and Alfresco, pricing of Amazon and Alfresco. The cluster or the diagram we have seen is uh, every we have seen like four Alfresco nodes, two in one uh, in the same uh, AC and the other in different AC, just in the same region, just mm -hmm. to save the money between, you know, the, the traffic between ACs and regions yeah. is cost different, well, between AC is free and between regions is paid. Yeah. It's just to, to clarify that. Question. Other questions? Um, yeah, just you, you mentioned um, like refining the cloud formation template, making that more module, but anything else kind of next, you know, that you can share as far as next things you're looking to do uh, in, in EC2? Um, so uh, we have a very uh, tight relationship with Amazon. In fact, the reason I'm doing this presentation is because Luis is at Amazon reInvent in Vegas, and we were actually on stage, I think, with some of the Amazon guys this week. Uh, Oh, no, that's next week at Salesforce, sorry. Um, so we have a pretty close relationship, but we've been talking to them about some other things. Their transformation services are quite interesting. Um, you know, some of their CDN and, and some of that stuff is, is quite interesting. Uh, so I don't know specific plans yet. We're kind of, uh, we're very much a market-led company, so as customers start using this and start asking us about some of those other things, uh, and that'll probably drive us to some of those other services. I think there's probably another handful of those that really make a lot of sense, like transformation, et cetera. Um, and a lot of that will just work. There's not, you know, there's nothing that we have to do on the product side, maybe on the configuration side. Uh, and then, you know, we'll continue to look at ways from a product perspective to better. Like the, the, the only thing on the product side, uh, that we've had to worry about so far was creating an S3 connector for Amazon so we can use S3 storage, right? So that's a, that's a productized piece that you can get from us that, that knows how to talk to the S3 storage device. Everything else that we've talked about didn't require any product changes on the Alfresco side. It's just configuration on. Yeah, the, the transformation was one, so that, that was good. The other one was the cloud search. Kind of curious if from a solar perspective or using the Amazon cloud search. But yeah, we, we, yeah. We, we I don't wait to hear, so yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I'll, I'll ask Luis about that because I'm curious too. But uh, um, I would imagine we'll start to see some of those things happen. We've got probably now, I, I think we've identified maybe 12 to 15 Amazon implementations of Alfresco in our customer base. Uh, as that number gets to 20, 50, 100, I would imagine we'll start seeing a lot more um, adoption of other Amazon services. Questions? No, no, uh, no, no, no. Don't, don't give him. No, I'm just kidding. As far as the cloud formation templates and sections of it that need to be uh, changed, pertinent to customers, are there certain aspects of a customer's requirements or a customer's planned environment that would lead them away, possibly from the cloud formation templates, or that would make them harder to use? I think it's probably, um, I think it's more a matter of do they want to use cloud formation as the mechanism for standing up their environment or not? Like if, if I was trying to stand up one that I wanted to be materially different than that for some reason, that it might just be easier to start from scratch or, or do it myself or whatever. I don't think there's anything limiting by the cloud formation technique for setting up the environment that I want. There's no reason why it would limit me from doing it. Um, so I, I don't think it's so much a matter of something in my environment is going to say yes or no for this template other than we don't want to learn how to modify the template and add in things that change the way we want to do it. Or 
you know, hey, I'm, I'm just going to set it up once and I'm, I'm going to assume I never have to do it again, so maybe I'll just do it manually. Um, but I think the idea of development environments and things like that, I think it's pretty interesting to have a couple of these, you know, in hand to use. The, I would agree with what you're saying with the caveat of if you're going to do any elastic stuff, you're mm -hmm. going to have your puppet and chef stuff dealing with your elasticity. Mm -hmm. Once you've programmed that, that can also spin up your environments. So if you are going to get into really using a design yep. for cloud and not just host it, you know, yep. what you have here is really hosted in the cloud, not designed for the cloud. When you start getting into the elasticity, you already need all those chef and puppet scripts and everything. It, then it closes the gap a little bit yeah. in terms of the benefit. It's a good question, and this is configured, and I don't know enough about it to talk about it in detail. This has some elasticity configured so that uh, it will spin up an extra alfresco node based on an existing AMI uh, as needed. So there's some of that in there, but I'm not as familiar with how uh, how it determines when it needs to do another a node. But there there is some of that in there. But you're right. I mean, some of those factors. Uh, again, you can use adding your chef and puppet stuff to what's in the cloud formation piece to facilitate that elasticity. Um, and I think that's kind of, you know, back to your question, I think, it's, I think it's the mindset of automated deployments that is the big leap. And then the techniques are syntax and, and scripting and whatever, right? So I think once you get in the mindset, to your point about design for cloud versus not, I think once you get in this mindset and you're like, this is not a one-time configuration that just happens once, so it's worth automating. Once you get in that mindset, then it's just a matter of do I use cloud formation, do I use Chef, Puppet, Vagrant, you know, all of these other things, uh, or do I, you know, use this, you know, then you can have a, a pretty quick decision about what's the right technique to use. And I think from our perspective as Alfresco, I don't think we're saying that this template is the be all, end all, do all. I think it's an example and it's pretty good and it does a pretty good job and it reflects some best practices. But you know, the world's your oyster, do it however makes the most sense. Any chance of uh, Postgres rack support and, or are we stuck with uh, MySQL for now? Um, uh, Not so, that I'm biased. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think that question is probably more about a supported stack for Alfresco than to do with cloud formation. Uh, so um, we support Postgres as a supported stack. Um, uh, yeah, so I don't think we've taken that one on yet, and I haven't heard any word. Have you heard any? Yeah, I haven't heard any word from our teams about uh, addressing that at this point. But uh, you know, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, that would seem like I, I don't know much about it, but I would imagine you know Postgres is an interesting platform. So uh, it just gives you the elastic. Yeah, it gives you some Postgres information. rack gives you the elasticity on the database where you don't get that outside of it. Yeah. That's the only upside. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. I appreciate you guys uh, hanging in there.